Hello friends. So, in this very small lecture, um, what I, I, I actually want to discuss with you is, uh, I'll start from uh, the discussion of uh, spatial frequency, okay? So, I will introduce the concept of spatial frequency. I'll show you some images, uh, some very beautiful images. And after the introducing the concept of spatial frequency, I'll go and discuss with you very briefly the concept of plane wave. I'll discuss with you how to write the equation and then also I'll do a very small derivation also. And after that, uh, I will start, I'll do uh, very briefly, I'll discuss the concept of Fourier decomposition. Okay, so I'll discuss that how you can actually represent any arbitrary function as a sum of sine and cosine functions. So I'll discuss with you the Fourier decomposition. And then I'll discuss with you a very important, which is the Fourier transforming property of a lens. Okay. Fourier transform property of a lens. I'll tell you that how you can actually uh, perform the Fourier transform optically by using a lens. And then after that, I'll move and I'll discuss with you uh, some of the examples to illustrate the concept of uh, Fourier transform by a lens. This will make it much clearer. Right? I'll discuss uh, some examples. And then at last, I'll discuss with you the concept of spatial frequency filtering. Okay, so this is actually the the most important concept that I would like to discuss. But before directly uh, before directly uh, discussing this concept, I think it is very much required to have a very basic background in all these concepts that I have mentioned uh, above. Okay, so I'll start with the spatial frequency. I'll try to cover all these concepts in one lecture, but if it's not possible, then you can see my next lecture. I'll provide you the description of next lecture in the uh, in the in the description section if you're watching this video on YouTube, okay? Okay, so now let's start. Okay, now everybody, uh, all of us uh, are familiar with the concept of temporal frequency. We have studied uh, since our school, high school, we generally denote this temporal frequency by uh, symbol nu. Uh, you might have, everybody of us have heard about signals having 50 hertz frequency, having 60 hertz frequency, or second inverse, you can write 1 hertz. So these are all temporal signals. So how this signal looks like, let me draw a small diagram for you. Let's suppose your x-axis is time coordinate and you are plotting a function which depends on time, which is a temporal signal, depends on the temporal coordinate. And let's say you have a sine wave. You have a signal of the form of a sine wave, right? So now you have an associated wavelength uh, with this uh, curve, with this signal, and you generally denote with this uh, denote this this wavelength with symbol lambda, small lambda. And if this wave is propagating because this is you're plotting with respect to time, so if this is a propagating wave, and if if it's having velocity v, then there is an associated temporal frequency, and we write this temporal frequency as v divided by the lambda. So this is the temporal frequency because the signal is depending on time coordinates. Now similarly, you can have a signal which is not depending on time but which is depending on spatial coordinates. All right. So let me show you some pictures because this will make it much clearer. Okay, let me show you this diagram. Now in this diagram, you can see you have black and white lines. I hope you can see. You can see black and white lines so this is like a grating you have black white black white and if we zoom if you the resolution is good the resolution of camera is good you can see that the transition from the black color to the white color is in a continuous manner actually it is a sinusoidal grating so if you scan along this axis let's say this is x axis then if you plot if you plot the function how you plot you can actually uh, assign any random values. For, for example, you can say that this black one is 0 or the white one is 1 
or you can say the white one is one and black one is minus one it depends on you so if you start to scan along this axis you will also get a similar kind of variation sign variation because this is sinusoidal grating so if you scan along x-axis right now you have x coordinates on the x-axis and you have a function which depends on spatial coordinates if you if, if you scan then you you also get a similar kind of variation because this is a sinusoidal grating that i showed you you will get sinusoidal variation and of course there will be an associated wavelength with this spatial with this function depending on spatial coordinate x so the wavelength corresponding to this function we denote it generally with a symbol capital lambda right and of course there will be uh, a, sp as a frequency associated with this uh, this this function so we generally denote this frequency with small f because you're scanning along x-axis it will be fx okay so this will we define this as the inverse of capital lambda okay and now this frequency is exactly what we call as spatial frequency okay spatial frequency because the function is depending on spatial coordinates and in the previous one you had the frequency temporal frequency because the function was depending on time coordinates, right? I can show you some other images. Uh, let me show you some other images. For example, here, the same thing. If you scan along the x-axis, you get uh, uh, some kind of variation here. Because it's a sinusoidal grating, you will get sinusoidal variation, right? And here, you can see you have two images, the first one and the second one. So as you can see, in this one, the wavelength is small. And in this one, the wavelength is large because it, the separation between two black lines is large. So that means that this is having very high spatial frequency. This is having low spatial frequency. High spatial because it is having low wavelength. Low spatial frequency because it is having high wavelength. Okay? Yes. So this is actually the basic concept of spatial frequency. Right? And now let me start with you the discussion of uh, plane waves. Okay, I'll go, go through it very quickly because uh, most of us are familiar. So generally we write the equation of a plane wave as, let me write, the equation of plane wave we generally write it as e exponential e raised to power j, where j is a complex number, k dot r minus omega t, where k is uh, the wave vector all of us are familiar r is a position vector and j is the complex number which is square root of minus one okay so now for the moment you can drop this temporal this time coordinate so you can write this as e raised to power j k dot r right so this k vector you can write as because k is a propagation constant it has the x kx component along the x-axis it has ky component on, along the y-axis, it has kz component along the z-axis, right? So now if you if your k is k vector, uh, this capital K vector, which is a propagation vector, if this is lying in the x-z plane, and if you're if you are if you are observing the k vector at z is equal to zero plane, okay? Because it is an x-z plane, you're observing at z is equal to zero plane. So this capital K dot R will simply become KX X. It will become um, KX X sine of theta because it is K dot R. Now what is that theta? Theta is actually the angle between the K vector and uh, this direction. If this is your uh, plane of observation then this is normal to the plane of observation and what you have is you have this is your x direction and this is your z direction because this is z is equal to zero okay so the k is that the theta is angle between the k vector and the normal to the surface so the k dot r it will simply become k x x sine of theta right okay so now that means that equation of plane wave becomes e raised to power j k uh, if, if you just call kx as k so it will become kx sine of theta okay where theta will decide the direction of propagation right 
Okay, now, uh, one more important thing is why do we call these waves as plane waves? The, the reason is that it is a plane wave is because the phase is constant over a plane. For example, if this is your phase part, right? This is your phase. So if you, or this is your phase, k dot r. So if you substitute k dot r is equal to constant, what is that k dot r? It is kx x plus ky y plus kz z. If this is some constant c, so as you can see, this is the equation of a plane in three dimensions. So that's why we call these equations as plane wave equation, uh, plane waves. We call these waves as plane waves because the phase is constant over it, over over plane, right? Okay. So now uh, I can show you. Okay. So firstly, let me uh, let me discuss one more important thing with you. Okay, so let's suppose you have a screen here, the screen of observation. You have a screen which is at z is equal to zero. So now how do we represent a plane wave? Okay, so let me draw first, then I'll explain. Let me draw the diagram first. Okay, just wait. Let me draw. Okay, now what am I drawing is, okay, so this is a plane wave. So what are these lines? You have these lines and you have a dotted line in between. Okay. So these lines are actually the lines of equal phase. So what does it mean? It simply means is that across these lines, the phase is constant. Okay, so let me show you a small animation before I start the discussion further because this will make it much clearer that what, what actually does these lines mean. Okay, okay, so let me show you a small animation. Okay, so as you can see, you have a plane wave. This white you have white and black lines white and black lines what are these black and white lines i'll show you in another animation so as you can see that this is a plane wave which is propagating at a at certain angle if this is your screen then you can define this angle to be the angle between the direction of propagation and normal to the screen as i mentioned a few minutes back so now, now let me show you this this animation from another angle this is a propagating wave now if you see this uh, same animation from some another angle, it will make it much clearer. Now you can see, see? Before that you were observing the plane wave, the propagating plane wave from the normal direction, but now you're looking from, the, from, from, from some angles. As you can see, you have a plane wave, you have a beautiful sine wave, which is propagating. And these lines, these lines are actually the lines of equal phase. For example, this line is uh, representing the crest or the, the, the other one is representing the trough. So these lines that I have drawn, that I have just drawn here, these lines are actually the lines of equal phase, right? So I hope you understand. This is a propagating wave. Again, you can see from the other angle, here it is. This is a propagating wave. Okay, these lines are actually what I am representing here. This line is having some some constant face across this line, across this contour. Okay, I, I hope it's clear. So now I can move on. So now these lines of constant face we can all we also call them as waveforms right wavefront means the face is constant over the wave over, over, over this line over this plane so now um, you can assign random values of face across these lines because let's say arbitrarily you you assign some face let's say this is zero face and um, let's say this is 2 pi or if this is zero phase, um, just wait. Yeah, 
Yes, so you just call this as zero. This is let's say pi. You would just assign this is two pi, let's say this is three pi, this is four pi, this is five pi, and this is six pi. Okay, so you have a variation of phase across the screen because the, the plane wave is coming at an angle. If this is these are the wavefronts, you just draw a normal just like that. So this will be your wave vector which you just represented by k. Okay, this is a wave front. Uh, this is a wave vector and it is propagating at an angle theta where this, this, this is the normal to the screen. So this is your wave vector which is propagating at an angle theta, right? So you have the variation of phase across the screen. Now if you scan, this is important, let me show you. Just wait, let me draw. Okay, so now if you scan across this uh, across this direction, let's say this is your uh, randomly you can call this as x-axis and this is your z-axis, okay? So if you scan across the x-axis, you have the variation in phase. Okay, now if you if you plot, then you will have you will have variation something like this. Let me draw first, then I'll explain. Okay. Yes, something like this. So if you scan across this direction, then you have a variation in the phase, okay? And because it's uh, it, 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 the variation is depending on uh, the spatial coordinate x, so that means that there will be some associated spatial frequency, uh, spatial frequency associated with this plane wave on the screen, on the plane of observation, right? Okay, so now let me do a small derivation with you. So what you do is, here you just draw a perpendicular. Uh, here you just draw a perpendicular which is at an angle 90 degrees. I hope you can see. So this distance, the distance between two crests, this is one crest, this is another crest. This is your small lambda. This is your wavelength. Okay. And what is your angle theta? Theta is actually the angle of angle between the k vector and the normal to the screen. So this is your angle theta. Okay. So now let me draw this triangle again here for you. We have this one. Then you have here and something like this. You have an angle 90 here. You have this theta. This angle is theta, right? If this angle is a uh, theta, then of course this angle will be this angle will be 90 minus theta, okay? And because this angle is theta, so that means this angle will also be theta, right? So that means that this angle is also theta. This angle, right? And now, if you scan across this direction then this will be your spatial frequency. This will be your wavelength corresponding to this spatial, uh, spatial frequency, capital lambda. So now if you write, let me take uh, another paper. If you write sine theta, if you write sine theta, then this sine theta will be given by, if you can see, this is sine theta, perpendicular divided by hypotenuse, so it will be small lambda, it will be small lambda divided by capital lambda, right? Now that simply means that 1 divided by lambda, 1 divided by capital lambda, that will be given by sine theta divided by small lambda. And as I mentioned, that this is exactly uh, the spatial frequency um, associated with the signal this 1 upon lambda, this 1 upon lambda is your spatial frequency. So that's, that means that this 1 upon lambda fx, the fx, the spatial frequency associated with the plane wave, that will be simply sine theta divided by lambda. Right? So this is your uh, spatial frequency associated. 
So as you can see that the spatial frequency depends on angle theta. That means that the spatial frequency across the screen it depends on that what angle your plane wave is propagating. For example, if you start to increase the angle, if your theta becomes larger and larger, if you start increasing theta, that simply means that your lambda starts to become lesser and lesser, capital lambda. And the spatial frequency fx starts to go up. Right? So now you can take a special case. What is the special case? The special case is when the angle of propagation theta is equal to zero. That means you have a normal propagation. Normal propagation. That means that plane wave is propagating normal to the screen. Right? So what is the situation? You have the screen. You see your screen of observation. And a plane wave is propagating like this sorry uh, yeah like this this is your k vector so now as you can see there will be no variation of phase across the screen because at one moment entire crest will be interacting with the screen because the phase is constant across this line because this line this black line is coinciding with the screen of observation that means that there is no there will be no variation of phase on the screen okay so that simply means that now this this kind of wave plane wave we call as on axis plane on axis plane wave right so what i have just discussed is let me write that plane wave plane wave propagating normal to the screen has zero spatial frequency radiation zero spatial frequency this is very important and the, the plane wave which is propagating at an angle these kind of plane waves we normally call them as call them as off axis plane wave off axis plane wave okay so this is important result the result is very simple that any plane wave uh, which is propagating uh, at an which is propagating normal to the screen has zero spatial frequency variation okay okay Okay, so now let me start another topic. This is very briefly I'm discussing in a very simple manner. Second, the third thing which I want to discuss is this, the Fourier decomposition. Okay? Fourier decomposition. Okay, so now what does it, what does it say? The Fourier decomposition, according to Fourier decomposition, you can actually decompose any given function as a sum of sine and cosine function. Okay, so let me write this. I'm going through very quickly. Fx, if your fx is any random function, any function depending on spatial coordinates x, so you can write this function as a0 divided by 2 plus you have a summation and going from 1 to infinity, you have a m cos nx plus bm sine nx so as you can see i have written this uh, function fx as a sum of sines and cosine for example for n is equal to 1 you have a1 cos x plus b1 sine x for n is equal to 2 you have a2 cos 2x b2 sine 2x so you can keep on writing and now your, your job is to determine the constants a, a n's and b n's. So there is a uh, you have to solve in, 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 in a simple integral uh, to calculate these a n's and b n's. I'm not going to write the formula for that. What I want to discuss with you is this example of directly. I want to go to example. So the example is a square wave. You have a square pulse. You have a square pulse. Um, You have a square pulse, uh, let's say this is your x-axis, this is a function fx, and your function fx is actually a square pulse. 
so you just draw a square pulse having certain period right let's say this is 0 this is t by 2 or you can call them as L also but okay it's T by 2 and you can call as T you can call as uh, 3 T by 2 2 T you can call them as L by 2 L 3 L by 2 2 L so now if you write the Fourier series corresponding to this square pulse then the Fourier series if you do this can be found you can find this in any standard mathematical physics book the Fourier series of a square pulse then this Fourier series is given by 4 divided by pi summation over n is equal to 1 3 5 you have only odd terms all the even terms vanish because of the symmetry associated with the function 1 divided by n you have sine n pi x divided by capital T right this is your Fourier series what does it mean you can expand it is 4 upon pi you have sine pi x divided by t plus you have 1 divided by 3 sine 3 pi x divided by t plus 1 upon 5 sine 5 pi x divided by t and so on it is an infinite series the more the number of terms you take more will be the accurate representation of the function okay so I can show you another uh, some graphs which will make the concept uh, much more clear okay so what I have is now first of all let's take only one term if you take only first term one term n is equal to one uh, okay let me let me do this okay so if you take n is equal to 1 as you can see <laughs> you have only one sign right because this is your original function fx and this is your only one term you are not taking all the terms now let's start taking more and more number of terms okay uh, if you take let's say 3 n is equal to 3 that means you're taking two terms okay so here it is you can see you have the sum sine of pi x divided by t plus sine of 3 pi x divided by t okay so now as you can see this is slowly coming towards the square pulse now if you start increasing number of terms let's say you take terms 12 you take 12 terms as you can see it's becoming better and better it's becoming closer and closer to the original function okay so let me take some very high number let's say you take 300 300 n is equal to 300 okay here it is you can see <clears throat> you have very beautiful representation because it's almost coinciding the series is almost coinciding with the original function of course there is uh, a small jump this is here this small jump is because of some kind of discontinuity associated we call this as Gibbs phenomena uh, this is uh, another concept to be discussed uh, uh, separately let's not discuss about this discontinuity but as you can see that Fourier series is representing the function very beautifully if you zoom in I can show you if you zoom you see you can see here it's very beautiful the oscillations are there but it's almost um, coinciding with the original function okay I hope this makes it clear okay so the important thing is the only important thing is that the more the number of terms you take the more accurate is the uh, the more accurate will be the representation the Fourier series okay so now as you can see this sign and this sign and this sign these are all having different frequencies see this is this sign is having lower frequency because we have 3 pi this is having higher frequencies so as you can see the higher terms are having higher frequencies okay so what the statement is that every function every function has a certain 
Okay, so what the statement is that every function has a certain frequency content. Okay, so as you can see that I have represented uh, the, the square pulse as a sum of sines and cosines because all these sines and cosines have certain frequency. Of course, the higher terms are having higher frequency, spatial frequency associated with them. So that every function has a certain frequency content within this. Okay. So to get this uh, the content of a function, to get this, the frequency content of the function, to get the frequency content of the function, you have to take the Fourier transform. This will directly give you all the frequencies pre present along with the relative amplitude of each and every frequency. Because as you can see here, the higher frequencies are having smaller magnitude because you're having one upon three, 1.5, 1.7, so 1.7 is less than 1.5, which is less than 1.3. So higher frequencies are having um, smaller magnitude. So what the Fourier transform operation does is that it will directly give you the frequency spectrum of a given function along with the relative amplitude. Okay. So for example, if you have the function gx, and if you take the Fourier transform, this will give you Uh, the function capital G of fx if this is a one dimensional function so this capital G will the function capital G will give you the frequency spectrum of the function okay and uh, this is one dimensional and if a G the original function is two dimensional x and y if you take the Fourier transform this will simply give you fx and fy okay so to get the free transform, or to get the frequency spectrum of a given function, um, you, you have to perform the Fourier transform, okay? Okay, so now, the next question is that, how do I get the Fourier, how do I get the spatial frequencies of a given pattern? Okay, so the next thing is that, how to get, how to get the spatial frequency how to get the spatial frequency of a given pattern okay optically how to get them optically for example you can have a pattern which looks something like this you have grating of something like this okay or you can have a grating like this okay or you, you can also have something like this random you can have something like this or even you can have something written on on a transparent sheet for example you can have some kind of symbol uh, written Th this will also have certain this is let's say opaque so this 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 pattern will also be having certain kind of spatial frequency you can also have binary grating you have you can have binary grating you have this uh, zeros here ones zeros something like this okay you can have a binary grating so if you scan so you will get some kind of square uh, square pulse kind of variation zeros and ones so this is a binary grating. I can show you a picture also. So th there will be some frequency spectrum. There will be some frequency spectrum associated with this binary grating also. And so the question is that how to get this, uh, how do we get, for example, here you can see, this is a binary grating, it has five cycles. This is also having 10 cycles. This is a binary grating. Of course, this one is having higher spatial frequency and this one is having lower spatial frequency, okay? So there will be some, uh, there will be some uh, f uh, spatial frequency spectrum associated with this, this kind of pattern. So how do I get that? So the answer to this question is, the answer to this question is that you have, you can get the Fourier spectrum using a lens. Okay. So let me write a new title, which is the Fourier's transform, the Fourier transform property of a lens. 
So now I'll discuss with you that how you can actually perform the Fourier transform operation optically by using a lens. Okay, I'll do a very small derivation. I'll not do completely, but I'll write all the important steps. Okay, so let's suppose you have a convex lens. You have a con convex lens. This is your front focal plane. This is your back focal plane. Okay, so if f small f is the focal length of this lens, then this will be the distance will be small f, and this distance will also be small f. Okay, so you call this plane as p1, and you call you have two more planes here, just touching the lens. You call this plane as p4, this plane as p5, and this plane as p2. Okay. And you can call this axis as z axis okay now you suppose that you have certain field across the plane p1 okay so for example you say that and the field at plane p1 you call this as zeta and eta okay you call uh, the plane the, the 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 field across the plane p1 to be zeta and eta now you want to propagate this field from plane p1 to plane p4 okay because our final job is to find the resultant field at the plane p2 but we will do in steps first we will propagate from p1 to p4 then we will go from p4 to p5 and then finally we will go from the plane p5 to p2 okay and finally at the end i will prove i will show you that the field at p2 is exactly the Fourier transform of the field which is present at plane P1. Okay, so what does it mean that if you place your pattern, if you you can take a transparent sheet, transparency you can print these patterns on a transparency sheet. You place that transparency sheet across the plane P1, and when you illuminate this 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 uh, transparent transparency with a plane wave then across the plane, the back focal plane P2, you will actually get the Fourier spectrum. This I will prove in a few steps. Okay, so our job is to first propagate from plane P1 to plane P4. And then from P4, we will propagate to plane P5. And from P5, we will propagate to the plane P2. Now, the question is that how you propagate a field from plane P1 to P4. The answer is, it is the propagation is taken care by a very standard Fresnel diffraction integral. Okay, Fresnel diffraction integral. You have to perform a two-dimensional integral, and you can actually propagate plane. You can actually propagate the field present at plane P1. To, from P1 to P4. So this propagation can be performed. Let me write the Fresnel diffraction integral for you. Okay, if you call U to be the field at plane P4, then U at P4 it will be given by J, which is a complex number divided by lambda F exponential minus J K F. K is a V vector. Okay. You have h of zeta eta, right? And then you multiply. This is being multiplied with exponential of j k with a minus sign divided by 2f. You have x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square and d zeta eta okay so what is zeta eta x and y so what i am doing is i am taking the coordinate system at plane p1 to be zeta and eta zeta eta coordinate system is at plane p1 okay and at plane p4 the coordinate system is x and y okay so you have a zeta eta field present at plane p1 and this deflection integral will Diffraction integral will perform the propagation process 
and finally you will get the field at plane p4 which will be a function of x and y because you are integrating across zeta and eta values and you finally this u p4 it will be a function of x and y so the coordinate system at plane p4 we are taking to be x and y okay now once you go from p1 to p4 now our next job is to, to propagate the field from the plane p4 to p5 now because here is a lens there is a lens in between p4 and p5 so the effect of this lens is simply to multiply the field at plane p4 uh, with a certain factor and what is that factor is uh, let me write for you for example now you want to propagate from plane p4 to p5 and there is a lens in between so the effect of thin lens and the effect of thin lens is you have the multiplication with you have the multiplication with a factor which is exponential of j k divided by 2f x squared plus y squared okay so what you can do is um, you can simply multiply the field present at plane p4 with a multiplicating factor e raised to power jk upon 2f okay so now you can actually um, have a deep uh, more in understanding of this factor i will show you some examples that what what does it mean to multiply uh, with this factor so let me show you an example so suppose you have a convex lens okay and at a distance f at a distance f you have a point source you have a point source at a distance f behind the lens and this point source will be giving you spherical waves okay now how you will write this equation of spherical wave the equation of spherical wave is a times which is amplitude e raised to power minus j k divided by 2f x square plus y square this minus sign is because this is a diverging wave if this was a converging wave there should be plus sign but this is minus because this is a diverging wave so this is the equation of spherical wave being emitted by a point source which is placed at a distance f behind the lens now as i mentioned earlier the effect of thin lens is simply to multiply the field uh, with, a, with a multiplicating factor this so as you can see if you multiply this field with this factor so these two factors get cancelled the only thing is you get a you get a constant so what is the meaning of this constant this constant is actually a non-axis plane view okay so what you get is you get a plane view okay I hope this makes it clear that the, this factor exactly cancels the curvature of a spherical wave and this converts the spherical wave into a plane wave, a non-axis plane wave because this is simply A. If this was an off-axis plane wave, there should be some factor here, exponential. But because this is on-axis plane wave, the angle sine theta is zero as I showed you a few minutes before. The angle theta is zero here because the angle theta is zero so this e raised to power zero will become one and you have certain amplitude in front of this okay so that means this will give you just a constant a and this a represents an on-axis plane wave and similarly you can have the other situation okay you can have a plane wave propagating you can have a plane wave coming from this side an on-axis plane wave which is simply a and now the effect of this thin lens will be to multiply this uh, this a with, um, with with the factor e raised to power jk upon 2f x square plus y square so this will make this plane wave to be a converging wave and this wave will converge at a distance f small f 
uh, on the other side of the lens okay so this will converge here at a distance f okay so this will introduce a curvature in the plane wavefronts so this will make it to converge at a point let's say p behind the lens and the equation of this converging wave will be a times this factor e raised to power j k upon 2 f x square plus y square okay so i hope this makes it clear so the effect of lens is simply to multiply the field at point p4 with a multiplicating factor this one and you will get the field at point field at plane across the plane p5 now the problem is simple now you have to propagate the, the field at point p4 p5 the, you have to propagate the field at point at plane p5 up to the plane p2 so now again you have to perform the the final deflection integral to propagating from to propagate from here to the final plane p2 okay so now if you do this calculation so let me write as i mentioned if you propagate from plane p5 to p2 then you have to again do the final deflection integral you have to do the final deflection integral okay so let me write down the final result i will not uh, do all the calculations if you are interested to have a complete description then you can read this book the title of the book is optical electronics optical electronics and the authors are optical electronics by a k gatak ajoy kumar kumar gatak and tyagarajan k tyagarajan P H Y A G A R A J A N. Okay, so these are all the faculty members at IIT Delhi, India. This is Cambridge University Press. Okay, so if you are if you are interested in having a detailed description then you can go and read this book there is a chapter and you can have all the derivations all the in between steps so let me write down the final result for you the final result is the field across the plane p2 it is given by g of xy is equal to 1 upon lambda f double integral h of zeta eta okay zeta eta is the initial plane h of zeta eta um e raised to power 2 pi j fx zeta plus fy eta d zeta d eta okay so this is if you look at this carefully then you can identify so what i have done is i have the propagation from the plane p1 to the plane p2 if h of zeta eta is the field at point p1 then across the p2 the field is given by g of x y is equal to 1 upon lambda f this double integral so if you look at carefully this is exactly the fourier transform this is the fourier transform So this is exactly the Fourier transform of H and zeta eta. So that means that if you want to have the special frequency content or the frequency content of any function or any transparency, then what you can do is you can just place that transparency on the back focal plane of a lens, of a convex lens. And if you place a screen uh, on the front focal plane, well, let, let me show you the diagram. If you plane your, place your transparency here at a distance small f behind the lens, then if you place your screen, the plane of observation, exactly at a distance small f on the other side, then you will get the spatial frequency spectrum. Okay, so this lens can perform. Uh, the, this lens can perform uh, 
uh, the Fourier transform operation. Okay. So now let me give you, let me uh, discuss with you some of the example and one more important thing, yes, because this is a function of x and y. Okay. This is a function of x and y and you have the integration across zeta and eta. So this fx and fy should be a function of x and y. So this fx is given by this fx is given by x divided by lambda f and this fy is given by y divided by lambda f these are the spatial frequencies this x and y are the spatial coordinates across the plane the final plane and this lambda is the wavelength f is the small f is the, is the focal length okay so now let me discuss with you some examples some example of Fourier transform operation by a lens so the first example is a point source. So how you can write a point source, equation of a point source, h of zeta, eta, you can write this a, some amplitude, delta function of zeta centered around zero, delta function eta centered around zero. So this will represent a point source. So physically what you have is, you have a transparent sheet, you have a small hole in between and you have a black everywhere. Okay, so this is opaque. This constant A will determine the size, the size of this hole. So this, this, is, this is the point source. Now if you substitute the value of H and zeta eta here, so what you will get is, g of x y um, g of x y is equal to a divided by lambda f we have double integral from minus infinity to plus infinity you have delta of zeta delta of eta you have exponential 2 pi j you have fx x fx of zeta fx zeta, fy eta, we have d zeta, d eta. Okay. Okay, one more important thing that I missed is that those of you who are not familiar with the friend diffraction integral, what you can do is, I have, I, uh, before a few months back, I had done uh, a lecture video which was dedicated to the derivation of these Fresnel diffraction integrals. So if you want to see the derivation of this Fresnel diffraction integral, um, you can see my lecture. I can provide you the link of that lecture in the description section if you're watching this video on YouTube. Okay. So if you want to have a derivation of this integral, please see this, this video, that video, the link of that video I'll give you in the disc description section if you're watching this video on YouTube. Okay. You can have a look at that. Now I have substituted the value of this h and zeta, zeta eta, uh, in, in in this integral. So as you can see, this delta function is non-zero only at zeta is equal to zero. This delta function is also non-zero at eta is equal to zero. So this zeta zero, eta zero will go here. You will get e raised to power zero, which is one. So the final value will be simply a divided by lambda f g of x y okay or you can say g of fx f y and x and y and fx and f y x and fx y and f y they are related to this 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 formula okay so what does it mean you get just a constant okay so let me draw the diagram again for you very quickly very quickly I'll go through. You have a point source which is giving you diverging wave and you have a screen at a distance small f behind the lens. You get constant. Constant means you get constant illumination. What does it mean? That if this is your screen, this is your screen then you get constant illumination okay constant illumination and this was your x y 
or equivalently fx and fy. So constant elimination simply means that all the spatial frequencies are present in a point source. Okay? So that means all fx and fy values So that means that in a point source, all the possible spatial frequencies are present. I'll discuss this point again later in the lecture. So now let me go to the second example. The second example is, let me take another paper. The second example is that you have a function h zeta eta, which looks something like this, a plus b times cos of 2 pi alpha zeta so you have a sinusoidal variation across the zeta axis ok so now you want to perform the Fourier transform through the lens so what you do is you again substitute the value of h zeta eta in this integral ok so let me write down you will get g of x y this will be given by 1 divided by lambda f this a this a will actually give you a dc term dc elimination and this b cos of 2 pi alpha zeta this will give you the modulation cosine sort of variation ok so 1 upon lambda f a times integral from minus infinity to plus infinity actually it is a double integral you have e raised to power 2 pi j you have fx zeta plus fy eta you have d zeta d eta then you have this plus sign b divided by lambda f double integral ok now this cos of 2 alpha 2 pi alpha x I can write this as half of e raised to power j times 2 pi alpha zeta plus sorry, plus e raised to power minus j 2 pi alpha zeta and again you have the factor this factor e raised to power 2 pi j fx zeta plus fy eta d zeta d eta so what I have done is I have simply written this cos of 2 pi alpha x in terms of exponential I hope all of you know that e raised to power i theta you can write it as cos theta plus i times sin theta which is very standard Euler's theorem and this cos theta you can write as e raised to power i theta i or j I am writing this j it's better to write j so cos of e is for j theta plus e is for minus j theta divided by 2 this is exactly what I have done and similarly you can write sine also which will be e to the power j theta minus of e to the power minus j theta divided by 2j but we are only interested in cos so this is what I have done here so now um, all you need to know is a very standard integral before you proceed a standard integral is that you have integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to power j 2 pi fx zeta d zeta that will be given by a delta function okay, this is actually the delta function representation this standard integral is equal to delta function centered around x fx is equal to 0 and you're getting in this kind of integral you are getting here you see e raised to power j 2 pi fx zeta d zeta and similarly j 2 pi fy eta d eta if you solve if you solve this integral what you will get is a divided by lambda f you have a delta function which is centered around fx a delta function which is centered around fy this one and for the second one you will get please do this this will be given by 
Okay, so now if you if you know if you know the, the value of this integral here, then uh, if you see if you compare um, if you compare the terms, for example, if you compare this term, if you compare this term with this one, then you will see that you will get delta of f x here, and you will get delta of f y here. Okay, so what you can write is let me write for you. That this will be given by <coughs> Okay, the first term, this integral, it will be given by a divided by lambda f. You have a delta of fx, delta of fy. See, because this is fx, fy. And if you come to the second term, then you will get b divided by lambda f. So again, you have to compare this integral. Uh, with the standard one so here you, what you have is you have j2 pi alpha zeta and this factor j2 pi fx zeta this is getting multiplied so now here you will get delta of alpha plus fx so you have delta of fx plus alpha right and you have plus sign you have this plus so plus, of course, yes, you, there will be a multiplication with delta of fy because this integration is over zeta also. You have plus delta of minus alpha plus fx, fy. Okay? So now, because this delta functions are non-zero, uh, only at fx is equal to the fy is equal to zero, these delta functions will be non-zero at fx is equal to plus alpha, fy is equal to zero. So this will be at fx is equal to plus alpha, fy is equal to zero. This will be at fx is minus alpha. So you get three non-zero values. So what are these th three non-zero values? Let me write for you. Let me write these non-zero values for you. So the first non-zero value will be fx is equal to zero, fy is equal to zero, corresponding to this term. The second non-zero value will be fx is equal to minus alpha, fy is equal to zero corresponding to this term and the third one will be fx is equal to plus alpha fy is equal to zero corresponding to this term okay so now since this fx and x fy and y are related to the relation fx is equal to x divided by lambda f fy is equal to y divided by lambda y lambda f that means the non-zero values you can write x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero, fx is equal to minus alpha lambda f, y is equal to zero, and x is equal to plus alpha lambda f, and y is equal to zero. Okay? So now what does it mean? Let me draw the diagram. You had the transparency, you had the function h and zeta eta onto the uh, front focal plane so this will be look, this will look like something like a grating, grating cosinusoidal grating with some dc component dc shift okay so let me draw this will look something like this you had this cosinusoidal variation this is your zeta axis this is your eta axis now if you what the lens will do is if this transparency is placed uh, in the front focal plane then if you place your screen on the back focal plane let's say this is your screen okay this is your x-axis parallel to zeta this is a y-axis parallel to eta or you can call this as fy axis this one is fx axis so what you will be getting is you have x is equal to zero y is equal to zero so you will get what one point here Okay, the second point is minus alpha lambda f y is equal to zero. So the second point is here, and of course the third point is here. And distance, this distance is alpha lambda f. You have alpha lambda f. Okay. So you have three spatial frequencies present: one at the center, and the two free spatial frequencies situated symmetrically on the plus and minus side. Okay. So this is a uh, one thing one important thing so which simply means that there are three spatial frequencies present uh, in the given function 
Okay, I hope you understand this now. Now let me give you another physical meaning of these three points. So what what is, what is the meaning of these three getting th give these three points? What is the physical meaning? Okay, so now in the same example that I am discussing right now, you have h of zeta eta, which is given by a plus um, cos of two pi alpha zeta. Right. So this you can write as this can also be written as a e is to power j zero, which is a plus you have one upon two e is to power j two pi alpha zeta plus e is to power minus j two pi alpha zeta using this Euler formula. Okay. So now. Let's see what is the physical meaning. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can write the equation of plane wave as e raised to the power j k dot r. Okay? Now, if your k vector, the, the propagation constant is in x z plane, and if your plane of observation is at z is equal to 0, then this can be written as e raised to the power j k zeta sine of theta, the dot product. Okay? Now, then this k can be written as e raised to the power j 2 pi divided by lambda zeta sine theta. Or this can be written as e raised to the power j 2 pi zeta sine theta divided by lambda. Now, this sine theta by lambda, it is nothing but the spatial frequency associated. So, this can be written as e raised to the power j 2 pi zeta alpha okay so this is another way of looking at the spatial frequency for example if you write the equation of a plane wave in this form then this the coefficient of j2 pi zeta will be the spatial frequency associated this is exactly what i have done uh, in, the, in, in a few minutes before okay so if you write the equation of plane wave in this manner uh, then you will be getting then this alpha will be the spatial frequency uh, which will be the uh, which will be sitting in front of j2 pi zeta okay uh, i'm looking for the paper just a minute okay so now this alpha is given by alpha is the spatial frequency now as you can see the given the given function h of zeta eta we can split it in term, into three terms. The first term is this one, the second term is this one, and the third term is this one. Okay? Okay. So now, that means that you have three plane waves present in this one. Okay? So, let me write down. The first plane wave is this is the first plane wave a times e is power j0. So a times e is to power j0. Okay. This plane wave is an on-axis plane wave, and this plane wave is represented by fx is equal to zero, fy is equal to zero point uh, in the frequency space. This one. I'll show you how physically you can understand. And the second plane wave which is half times e raised to the power j 2 pi half times e raised to the power j 2 pi zeta alpha this is represented by the point fx is equal to alpha fy is equal to zero this point how i will tell you just a few minutes after and the third plane wave e raised to the power j minus j 2 pi alpha zeta this will be represented by the point fx is equal to minus alpha fy is equal to zero this point okay so how 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 you can understand this so now this is these three points the i have represented the given function in terms of plane waves so that means what i have done is i have done the fourier decomposition i have done the fourier decomposition
in two plane waves. I have written uh, I have written the given function as the sum of plane waves, and there are three plane waves in our given function. So there will be three points uh, in the three points in the in the frequency space. Okay. So let me draw an, uh, a diagram. Then I will illustrate with you the concept. For example, if this is your transparency, you place this transparency at zeta eta plane and you have a lens uh, you have a lens sitting at a distance of small f focal length and uh, you have screen you have your screen uh, which is at a distance of f exactly f behind the lens this is your screen and here is your transparency you have your let's say pattern costs 2 pi alpha variation and now what you do is you eliminate this transparency with the plane wave so now when this plane wave fronts will pass through this transparency what will happen is these plane, plane waves will get distorted something like this after interacting with this one now let me draw these wave fronts here let's say this is a given wave front after passing this is not sinusoidal it's random now what you do is if you do the Fourier decomposition which I have done a few minutes back so I have got three plane waves. The first plane wave was on our on axis plane wave. So that means this can be written as a sum of three plane waves. The first plane wave is an on axis plane wave which is propagating in this direction. Okay. The second plane wave, this one, the second plane wave, it will be an off axis plane wave and it will be going in this direction. Okay. And the third plane wave will be going in this direction. Okay, so you have got three plane waves. You have got three plane waves. Now you can ask me that why this is in why this plus term is going in up direction and this minus is going in this direction. This is also very simple. You can do a very simple exercise. If this is a plane wave k dot r, and if your k vector is in x z plane, if your k vector is in let's say this is x, and this is z your k vector makes an angle theta and if you do the observation at z is equal to 0 plane then this can be written as e raised to power j k x sine of theta and similarly if your propagation takes place in this direction minus in minus x z direction this is your k vector then the component of this k vector along the x axis will be minus negative so it will be minus j k x sin alpha that means this minus one will be going in this direction at an angle theta plus one will go in this direction the up direction at an angle plus theta so this is exactly what i have written you have a plus you have a minus these values are same you have, the only difference is plus and minus that means these two plane waves will be going symmetrically in the opposite direction at a given angle theta. If this is theta, this will also be theta. You have three plane waves. Okay, after the Fourier decomposition. So now you what you do is you place a lens at a distance of f and you place a screen, screen of observation again at a distance f. So what will happen is this plane wave will be focused at the center of this coordinate system. This plane wave will be focused somewhere here and this plane wave will be focused somewhere here. Okay, so that's why you're getting three points. You're getting three points in the frequency space. This is Fourier transform plane. I call this as a Fourier transform plane. And this distance, as I have explained, it will be alpha lambda f. And this distance will also be alpha lambda f. So that means that these three points represent three plane waves okay so now you can make a very important statement the statement is let me write down the statement here that <coughs> the statement is that every point onto the back focal plane represents a plane wave okay because you have you have got three points one two three 
So this is these three points correspond to three plane waves. The center one was the on-axis plane wave, and these two are the off-axis plane wave. There might be more points, but it depends on the on the on the function h of zeta eta, the what kind of function you have on the on the on the front focal plane. Okay. So the, the important statement is that every point onto the uh, on the back focal plane represents the plane wave. So now, as if if you remember, uh, in the first example I had done, I had discussed with you uh, was the point source example. This one, the first example that I discussed was a point source. And in this one, you had got a constant value. That means I said that all f x and f y values. You have all the spatial frequencies in a point source. What does it mean? What is the physical meaning of that? Now let me show you. So let me again write down, this is an important statement I mentioned. Now what I'm saying is that a point source, that a point source contains all spatial frequencies. What does it mean? For example, you have a point source here and you have a spherical wave emitted by this point source. This is a diverging. Now, as you know, if you want to draw the wave vector, it should be normal to the, the wave front. And because these are wave fronts, one normal will be in this direction. Another normal will be in this direction. In this direction. Any direction you draw, it will always be normal to the wave fronts. Okay, in between also. So that means you have you have all the k values. You have all k values present. That means that because you have all the k values, you need infinite number of plane waves to make a point source, a perfect point source. That's why I, I, I that's why we had made a statement that a point source contains all the spatial frequencies because the you have k vectors in all the directions okay so this is an important statement a point source has all the possible spatial frequencies okay now the third and last example that i want to discuss with you is a third example in this one you have the form of h of zeta eta this is cos of 2 pi alpha zeta plus cos of 2 pi beta zeta alpha is greater than beta now again if you substitute this h of zeta eta in this integral and if you do the calculations so what you can write again you can write this one as half of e raised to power j 2 pi alpha zeta plus e raised to power minus j 2 pi alpha zeta plus half e raised to power j 2 pi beta zeta plus e raised to power minus j 2 pi beta zeta again if you substitute this h of zeta eta in this in this integral so you, the non-zero values that you will be getting are okay i will directly write down the result so h of x y it will be given by 1 upon 2 lambda f you have delta of alpha plus fx delta of fy plus delta of alpha minus fx delta of fy you have plus delta of beta plus fx delta of fy you have plus delta of minus beta plus fx and delta of fy okay so you get four non-zero values okay so now let me write down the non-zero values the non-zero values are fx is equal to minus alpha fy is equal to zero this is one value the other value will be plus alpha zero the third value will be minus beta zero and the fourth value will be plus beta zero these are the four non-zero values and equivalently you can write in terms of x to be minus alpha lambda f and y is equal to zero second one you can write plus alpha lambda f 
y is equal to 0 now minus beta lambda f y is equal to 0 and the fourth one is plus beta lambda f y is equal to 0 these are fx and fy is the x and y you have a relation fx is equal to x divided by lambda f and fy is equal to y divided by lambda f okay so then let me draw this diagram again you have a you have a plane h of zeta eta okay you have this variation this variation across this plane grating you have some kind of grating here okay now do you eliminate this grating with the plane wave so what you get you get a distorted wave front now again here you have four plane waves one two three and four plane waves and these are symmetrically situated for example you have plus two pi alpha zeta minus two pi alpha zeta these are two symmetrical plane waves and these are the two other symmetrical plane waves so you can write these two plane waves as like this one this is the first plane pair of plane waves this is the second pair of plane waves and the other plane wave is going like this going like this this corresponds to alpha minus alpha this corresponds to plus alpha this corresponds to plus beta uh, let me see oh yes alpha is greater I think it should be alpha is greater I think let me reverse alpha is less than beta so alpha is less than beta so that means this is minus beta now you place the lens you place your lens here at a distance f and uh, you have a screen you have a screen of observation here you have the screen of observation this is a screen okay this is x-axis this is y-axis this is again at a distance f so you get four points the first point will be here and here the second pair will be here and here and the distance let me draw the distance okay let me draw this plane here this is your x this is your y so you get these two points and these two points and because your uh, um, your alpha is uh, less than beta so this distance will be alpha lambda f alpha lambda f and this distance will be beta lambda f and similarly this distance will be minus alpha lambda f and this distance will be plus uh, minus minus beta lambda f yes so because you're getting four points so you have four plane waves okay because this is a, these are the four plane waves you can actually Fourier decompose now let me discuss with you the concept of spatial frequencies because now you understand that what is the meaning of spatial frequencies now let me come and now let me start and let me start discussing with you um, the concept of spatial frequencies okay so spatial frequency filtering I'm sorry spatial frequency filtering So in the first example that I discussed with you was a point source example. So in this one you had a point source, you had a point source, zeta eta plane, and onto the Fourier plane you get uniform illumination. This was the first example. In the second example, you had a cosinusoidal grating you had h of zeta eta in the second example and you got three points one corresponding to on axis and two points corresponding to off axis in the second example of 
course this is zeta eta plane or you can just call this fx fy and this is your xy or you can call this fx and fy because they are related and in the third example which i just discussed with you we had a grating having some functional form and you got four points two points and other two points and this calls the the functional form was cos of 2 pi alpha x plus cos of 2 pi beta y beta x okay alpha was less than beta now what you what we can do is that we can use filters we can use filters to eliminate unwanted frequencies okay so what we can do is that on the Fourier plane um, we can use uh, filters uh, filters having specified a uh, shape uh, in order to filter out uh, in order to filter out unwanted frequencies so this can be done very easily I'll show I just show you okay so you will be getting four points corresponding to this functional form of h of zeta eta function here you have cos of 2 pi alpha x plus cos of it should be cos of 2 pi alpha zeta and cos of 2 pi beta eta so if you have this functional variation you will get four points and as i mentioned that we can use filters to eliminate unwanted frequencies so let me discuss with you this concept and this is what we call as spatial frequency filtering this is a spatial frequency filtering q u e and c okay because you can um, filter out the unwanted frequencies to modify the h of zeta eta function and uh, this kind of filtering is known as spatial frequency filtering okay so how you will be doing this let me take the same example okay let's say this is your uh, this is let's say your zeta axis you had some variation of function something like this okay this was your cos of 2 pi alpha zeta plus cos of 2 pi alpha uh, beta zeta and what you do is you place a lens right which is at a distance of small f so after fully decomposition you get four plane waves and these plane waves are getting focused on the back focal plane so you get four points as I mentioned before okay so again the distance was alpha lambda f and this one was also alpha lambda f and this was beta lambda f and beta minus beta lambda okay so now what you can do is what you can do is you can use filters you can use filters to filter out these frequencies for example you can place some opaque filter in front of these two uh, frequencies so, so that these two frequencies don't pass okay and again you place another lens this is your L1 this is your L2 so you place another lens at a distance small f so now what it will do is the first lens was doing the Fourier transform of h of zeta eta and you got the spatial frequency the Fourier transform plane this is the Fourier transform plane now you use another lens to perform the, the Fourier transform second time so now what will happen is because you are filtering out these two spatial frequencies so the Fourier transform of only these two spatial frequencies will be performed and you will get a beautiful sinusoidal variation at the final plane at the final plane because you have filtered these two frequencies and you have only because this distance was beta lambda alpha so this cosinusoidal form will be cos of 
this will be cos of uh, 2 pi beta zeta okay because you have filter of these two if you instead of putting filters here if you put your two filters here then here you will get 2 pi alpha zeta but because you have filtered these two frequencies now you're getting 2 pi beta zeta so you can filter out unwanted frequencies okay and uh, because in this case you have a 4f 1f 2f 3f 4f so this kind of uh, experimental setup is known as 4f 4f system okay this is a very standard system in optical information processing so this is your 4f system okay so you can place um, you can place uh, filters having appropriate size shapes to filter out unwanted frequency this is a very simple example that can illustrate this concept very easily okay so now instead of having very simple input you can have some very random uh, inputs at the input plane for example you can have a transparent sheet and you can print some alphabet on this like this this is your opaque part right this will be transparent now if you, if you perform the Fourier transform of this kind of transparency by using the same 4f setup then at the Fourier plane this is Fourier transform plane you will get spatial frequency but this, this the frequencies will not be looking symmetrical like this because here the functional form was very easy but here the functional form is very complicated so you will get uh, frequencies in all the directions everywhere you will get some frequencies okay you will get all the spatial frequencies even at zeros and in all the fx and fy values okay because your functional form is not uh, very easy now here you can use a filter what you can do is you can use a filter which only allows to pass the lower frequencies okay this is your low pass filter because of spatial frequencies which will be lying within this region within this circle will be allowed to pass so effectively when you place this filter here only these spatial frequencies will be getting passed and after this plane and now the second lens will again do the Fourier transform okay you will again get your image back but this now image will be inverted okay this image will be inverted now but the difference is because now you have uh, you have uh, filtered out the higher spatial frequencies so its edges will become smooth edges will become smooth edges will become smooth because at the edges you have very sharp variations so these sharp variations will give you plane waves at very high angles so these plane waves at very high angles are having high spatial frequencies because they are propagating at a very high angle so the spatial frequencies which is sine theta by lambda that spatial frequency will be very large and now because you have placed a low pass filter so these high frequencies will get filtered out okay now because these high frequencies were coming from very sharp edges now after being getting filtered by the filter uh, the image that you get its edges will become smooth okay so I can show you some images that how this kind of filtering can make the edges smooth here you have you have an example you can see I hope you can see okay so in this example in this example I have taken symbol A but in this example I have taken this uh, diagram from the same book this optical electronics by Gatak and Tyagrajan so this is the input image as you can see it has very very sharp details very small dots and everywhere and now this is this is the Fourier spectrum this is the Fourier spectrum of this this image this is the Fourier, trans, Fourier spatial frequency spectrum that they will get uh, in a, on the back focal plane of the lens now what they have done is they have placed a low pass filter that means they have allowed only low frequencies to pass through and they have blocked all the high frequencies so after the frequency filtering they have done another Fourier, another Fourier transform operation using this lens 
and the image that they get back is this one. Now, as you can see, all the details that were contained in the image have gone off. You can see clearly. So this image is very smooth. And this image is very sharp. <coughs> so same, the main idea is that you can use spatial frequency filtering to filter out the higher spatial frequencies so the edges will become smooth. Or you can also filter out the unwanted reflections that might be caused in your image. So you can these unwanted reflections will give you very high spatial frequencies. You can filter out them and you can process your image. Okay, you can make the edges uh, small, or you can also use uh, high pass filters according to the application. And there is one another very important application which I would like to discuss with you is it is the the application is that the spatial frequency uh, filtering can be used to used to clean out the input input beams from uh, from from some laser because because at the at the exit of the laser at the aperture of the laser there might be some dust particles present okay so these dust particles will actually uh, deteriorate the input beam the output beam of the laser for example here you have shown that this is your input beam very clean beam but because there were some dust particles present so they, these dust particles will make the beam to scatter in all the directions okay so this will make the beam some kind of uh, you can say it's uh, it becomes shabby the beam becomes shabby so to clean this beam you can use the 4f system you can use the first lens to perform the Fourier transform so this is your Fourier transform plane here they have used a pinhole pinhole will act as a low pass filter so that it will only allow to pass low frequencies higher frequencies will get filtered out now the important thing is that these kind of reflections, these uh, scattering from the dust particles, they will uh, they will uh, contribute to the higher spatial frequencies. Okay, so these higher spatial frequencies you can filter out. So if you filter out these spatial frequencies, you have actually cancelled out uh, the scattering effects from the dust particles. Okay, so you can place a small pinhole so that you only allow to pass through. Uh, very small spatial frequencies, higher spatial frequencies are filtered out and now you again do the second Fourier transform you get a very clean spatial profile beam. Okay, so this can be used to to clean the spatial profile of a laser beam. Okay, so let me show you one another image. This is an image, as you can see, this beam is not very clean. As you can see, because of some kind of uh, dust particles or some kind of uh, uh, errors, some scattering for dust particles, there is some reflections, some, some uh, beam is present outside, some intensity is there. So, to carry out your experiment, for example, in interferometric experiments, you need very clean laser beams. So, these kind of laser beams cannot be used, they will not give you very accurate results. So, you can clean the spatial profile of your laser. Uh, by using the 4F system actually these kind of systems are available embedded uh, in the microscope, microscope objective these days but you can make your own special uh, filtering experiment to filter out the unwanted frequencies so after the filtering this is before filtering and after the filtering you get a very clean beam because all the higher special frequencies have been uh, have been filtered out so this is a clean beam okay so this is the original beam, this is a clean beam, clean beam uh, using the spatial frequency uh, 4F system, okay. So this is uh, another example. So with this uh, discussion I would like to close. So I hope you understood the concept of spatial frequency. Uh, I have discussed with you uh, the concept of spatial frequency, then Fourier decomposition, I introduced the concept of plane waves, on-axis plane wave, off-axis plane wave. And then I told you that how to calculate the spatial frequency of a plane wave. And finally, I did the Fourier transform property of a lens with some examples. I discussed with you three examples. The first one was the example of a, a point source. Second one was the example of a, some kind of a plus b times cos of some two pi zeta alpha kind of variation in the h of zeta eta function. And also I discussed the quite similarly the third example, then using the third example I introduced the concept of spatial filters, 
I discuss how you can use low pass filters or filters of any specified shape to, to modify the input uh, h of zeta eta function and then uh, I discuss how you can smooth how you can smoothen the edges of an image by filtering out the higher spatial frequencies and at last I discuss with you that how you can use 4F system to make the laser beam a very clean beam I mean the beam which becomes shabby because of spurious reflections being caused by the dust particles present at the exit pupil of the laser of, of, of the laser system so you can use 4F system to eliminate these kind of reflections by filtering out the higher spatial frequencies okay okay so thank you so much i hope you enjoy